Thank you very much. Dobar dan. Uh, good morning, everybody. Ovo puta, čekavorite na engetsku. It's a dangerous thing to be an amateur opening a conference of professionals. To be doing so using their medium, their means of communication rather than your own is to use typically British irony, quote, courageous, unquote. So I'll start in the traditional way and say that it's an honor for me to be invited to speak to you today. Uh, and I will continue in a less traditional way by saying that I probably need more advice from you than you need from me. Diplomacy, generally speaking, is about policy, people and places. A diplomat's life and work is about presenting policy, meeting people and visiting places. That's a bit tricky at the moment. I wouldn't go as far as one uh, well-known commentator for Carnegie Europe who said that coronavirus had, I quote, brought diplomatic activity to a standstill, unquote. But I would say that there's quite a lot of what we normally do that we can't do now or that we've got to do differently. I might even say tentatively, like many other professions, we will probably discover that there are some things we've been doing that we don't actually need to do. Like other professions too, we are probably spending far too much time online uh, now that technology allows us to hold meetings with colleagues around the world at the drop of a hat. Um, hopefully we will learn to find productive and proportional uses for all these new capabilities. Diplomacy used to be conducted behind closed doors. Diplomats and their profession had a certain status and a certain mystique. When I was a child at a village school in the UK, I had no idea what a diplomat was, and if I had wanted to know, I could probably have found a short definition in a dictionary. But now I could look on that same child, could look online and find a whole world of diplomacy if they wanted. So I have a challenge for you. I know that the timing this morning doesn't allow for questions, but I would really like ideas. Let me present two conundrums or paradoxes. The first, example one. The British Foreign Secretary, our Foreign Minister, has 258,000 followers on Twitter. The Foreign Office cat, I repeat, cat, C-A-T, who's called Palmerston, Twitter handle at Diplomog, has 112,000 followers on Twitter. So he doesn't have as many as the Foreign Secretary but he has more than most ministers and he has a lot more than any British ambassador. But you can't ask a cat to tweet about international negotiations or nuclear arms policy. Example two, I'm an experienced diplomat. I've been a diplomat for over 30 years. I've been trained to write carefully argued foreign policy advice and analysis, presenting all the arguments carefully and, and thoroughly. And my job is to represent my country, not my personality. But I get much more attention on social media if I play a musical instrument or if I post a picture of my bicycle. Thousands of people read a blog that I wrote about hats and gloves when I was quite a junior diplomat. So it's, 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 a, it's a paradox for us. The online world presents many challenges for diplomats, not just the risk of getting it wrong and causing embarrassment with a badly judged post. More importantly, it's a challenge for us that social media favors the brief, the ephemeral, the superficial. It favors the entertaining over the serious. And when you're representing your country, that's a careful balance to strike between the entertaining and the serious. In normal times, it's fine, it's okay. The fun stuff, the colorful stuff, the funny stuff. That presents a more human side of diplomats, makes people interested, it presents a more human side of diplomacy, it makes it more approachable. It gives us also different ways to convey messages and reach new audiences. But sometimes you need more than an Instagram snap or 140 characters on Twitter to talk about serious and important issues. Or well, sometimes 140 characters is enough for an important topic, but the audience doesn't actually find it that interesting. Maybe because it hasn't got a picture of a cat in it or a bicycle. 
So the real challenge for us is how to be effective now in coronavirus times when online diplomacy is a lot of, well, I won't say it's all we can do, but it's a lot of what we can do at the moment. So my questions would be, how should you be a diplomat when most of your meetings are over a video link? When you can't hold big events or <laughs> um, when you can't travel around easily? Of course, there's good digital diplomacy and there's bad digital diplomacy. Um, there are also technical limitations. I did find prepare some Twitter slides to give you some examples from my own um, body of Twitter work, <laughs> but I haven't worked out how to show them to you. But you know, there's good there's good digital diplomacy, there's bad digital diplomacy, and in the middle, there's a lot of stuff that diplomats post that isn't particularly good. It isn't particularly bad. But the only only people that like it are other diplomats or the people in the photographs. I'm sure you all know what I mean. Pictures of meetings, great meeting, good to meet. We all do it. Pictures of panel discussions at conferences, great discussion. Or pictures of a slide at a conference, I sometimes do that as well. And now we can post shots of online meetings. In fact, here's one my team prepared earlier today. So, as for diplomatic exchanges, the substance, diplomatic relations conducted online, hmm, it can be entertaining for the wider public, but I think we've all seen this week that it's not necessarily a recipe for strengthening relationships. I'm not going to, not going to name names, but I think you've all seen the Twitter exchanges this week between two countries. As a diplomat, I can use digital media to interact with people. I can use it to inform them, I can use it to entertain them. And of course, all diplomats would like their social media to have a positive influence on what people think about their country. So we're still all exploring how best to work offline and online in a coronavirus world. But keep it simple. Let's assume that I want to use social media and online communication to one, reach an audience of decision makers and make sure they understand British policies and British views, two, to promote things that are important <coughs> like environmental protection or media freedom, um, and three, to create that positive impression about the UK, my country, for a wider audience. So how can I do it? My questions for you would be, are we using the right tools to communicate? Are we creating the right content? Have we got the right skills? And actually, Frankly, what would you do? So, my Twitter handle is Sean C. McLeod. <laughs> That's quite difficult to spell, but you can probably see my name on the screen and it has a C for my middle name in the middle. Sean C. McLeod. After this, I will tweet with the hashtag Diplomata. Or you can drop a line to my media team if you on, uh, look up on UK, at UK in Serbia. So I look forward to any ideas anybody has. In the hats and gloves blog that I mentioned, I quoted an old diplomatic handbook from the 1950s or 60s that said, public speaking, do not speak for too long. Your audience is more likely to stay awake. The same book also told women to keep a hat and gloves in their drawer in case of emergencies. Um, but I would have fit if finished now with a good example of tweet by uh, that did, that was both uplifting and informative because I, I, there's a lovely tweet that I've just reposted from colleagues in London about climate change and about air quality. So that's, I think, a good example of when we do get it right, but it is a challenge. But anyway, I'm going to keep the audience awake. It's early in the morning. You've got a long day. So I'm going to stop speaking. And I'm going to say again, thank you very much for listening to me. Kavala. <laughs>